arbitration, I think uh, both will be not hesitant to use the enforcement mechanisms that we negotiated in the USMCA and put those to the test uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, in terms of the actual items that we're still working on, the first one you see there um, was from uh, Secretary Romanski in Wisconsin, Commissioner Ball in New York were the original sponsors. Uh, it's really about protecting common food names and trade agreements. Um, as many folks know, the EU, particularly on dairy and meat, has been very, very aggressive trying to get specific terminology restricted for use uh, from American exporters in different markets. So um, we've been working through coalitions, um, including one led by the National Milk Producers Federation, on making sure that both in international settings and also in bilateral trade agreements, uh, the U.S. is really taking action to make sure that common food names are protected and that we can use our exporters can use those names when they're operating in foreign markets. So that's one that's, that's been a, a pretty big priority for us. The second one down there you see um, is not directly trade related, but still something we've been spending some time on under the committee's jurisdiction. Uh, it's supporting the USDA Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. Uh, the latest we've heard from USDA there, they're definitely working on standing up that office, but it hasn't obviously been the biggest priority in the last few months. They did get some grants, um, some really effective grants out the door. So um, states can apply for those and there are certain um, you know, grants that will help urban agriculture production. So we're still tracking that closely, working on it, um, but there's been a lot of change over there as you can imagine and with, uh, with all the COVID-19 recovery needs. The third one down um, that I wanted to highlight is on US-China trade negotiations. Um, you know, this is still existing because we have the phase one deal that we're obviously working on. Um, everything that we heard, especially from uh, Ambassador Dowd yesterday, he was very thorough, I think means that we're in a good place when it comes to that. But the actual action item that NASA had passed covers not just a phase one agreement, but a phase two agreement and a, and a comprehensive deal that we have with China. Uh, unfortunately, I think the prospects for that are, are very slim in the near term. There's a lot of tensions happening, as most folks are probably aware. And I think that the idea of us getting to a comprehensive deal with China that goes beyond phase one before the election is, is probably a, a pipe dream. But nonetheless, I think this is still an open action item. We all care very much about China. We're pleased to see the progress they've been making on the technical barriers to trade side. And so we're hopeful that phase one continues to be implemented in such a thorough way uh, and that there's going to be resumption of high-level dialogues between Ambassador Lighthizer and some of his counterparts over in China. Uh, the fourth one down is the critical need for export markets. This is really a general statement of philosophy that NASDA has on the importance of exports to our overall agriculture and food economy. And I think that the really important thing here is just to remember how important exports are going to be in our recovery. So COVID-19 recovery is going to require us to be active in international markets and make sure we're not losing market share over the long term to some of our major competitors. So um, between virtual trade missions, other you know, offensive trade agreements that uh, the administration has been working on, we feel like there's good progress there, but we need to keep the pressure on and make sure we're still finding ways to, to really be play offense, um, as, uh, as Secretary Nag likes to say, on these trade agreements. Um, and then the final one that I wanted to, to highlight is just the importance of the World Trade Organization and dispute settlement. Obviously, there's been a lot of challenges with the WTO. Um, we've documented those for a long time. But the organization has also played a really strong role in elevating agricultural trade standards and making those uh, export markets more amenable for U.S. products. So I think from NASA, we, um, back in 2018, had agreed that reform was very necessary and we support the administration's efforts uh, to reform the whole process. But we also don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and we want to make sure we're engaging not just with the WTO, but in, it, in other international fora as well, whether that's Codex uh, or other uh, international bodies. So um, that's the current status of what we're kind of working on and the major action items that we are uh, pushing forward and through. Um, I will uh, pause there, see if there's any questions on the outstanding actions that we have or um, anything else. Okay, I guess I can turn it back to Director Sanderson. Thank you, Max. Appreciate it. Um, and the next opportunity for, for um, introducing policies uh, would be the, the Winter Policy Conference in 2021. So, um, you know, be thinking about that. And if there's, uh, you know, particularly in the light of COVID, if that's, you know, there, there are issues that have arisen because of that that we need to address, certainly uh, keep that in mind and be ready for, uh, for our meeting in 2021, early 2021. Um, so the next uh, agenda item is um, uh, uh, 
Jeff uh, Albanese, uh, Senior Agricultural Marketing Specialist at USDA, who's um, going to talk about the, um, uh, the trade credit program. This is a program we don't hear much about, but it's very important to, uh, to, uh, to agricultural industry in terms of being able to, uh, to compete, compete globally in the, in the world of trade. So Jeff, uh, go ahead and take it away. Sure, thank you, Director Sanderson. Uh, and thank you all for uh, having me here today. So I wanted to talk about uh, two USDA programs, the Export Credit Guarantee Program, also known as GSM 102, and the Facility uh, Guarantee Program. And so the GSM 102 Export Credit Guarantee Program uh, is designed to facilitate the financing of US agricultural exports overseas to developing countries. And so the way we do that is through uh, providing uh, for a fee a credit guarantee, which uh, reduces foreign bank non-payment risk for the exporter. So when uh, an exporter and an importer enter into a transaction uh, using one of our approved banks, then we are essentially guaranteeing to the exporter uh, that you are going to get paid. And so, uh, this allows U.S. exporters to uh, target riskier markets where they otherwise might not uh, have done business because of uh, banking uh, considerations or some hesit hesitancy uh, with the ability to uh, get paid uh, by that party. So this program uh, is able to uh, mitigate risk for uh, U.S. exporters. And the facility guarantee payment functions uh, in very much the same way, except it's designed to um, facilitate the sales of US manufactured goods and also services. So those could be engineering consultancy services. Uh, so that's the primary objective of those two programs. And with the uh, GSM program, the Export Credit Guarantee Program, it's a uh, letter of credit based program. So all transactions are taking place via a letter of credit with uh, approved pre-vetted USDA banks. Um, as mentioned, we're mitigating non-payment risk, we're developing country focus, uh, and we do offer uh, credit terms up to 18 months. So that would mean a US exporter under this program could get paid immediately while the, the importer has a period of up to 18 months to repay the participating uh, U.S. banks. So that's one of the big perks of the program for the U.S. exporter is uh, to get uh, immediate payment. And we're covering up to 98% of the value of the sale, so virtually all. Uh, there's just 2% risk that the, the exporter or uh, his or her U.S. bank would take on. And uh, one requirement of the program is that these are uh, U.S. agricultural commodities. So the product does need to, to be US product. Um, each year we're authorized $5 billion. Uh, right now we're at a little bit over $2 billion. So for this fiscal year, there's still plenty of uh, allocation left. And uh, starting in the new fiscal year, October 1, then there'll be a uh, fresh round of allocation, roughly uh, $5 billion. Um, so for uh, State Departments of Agriculture, um, when you're working with constituents uh, who are maybe new to export or looking to export, maybe expand their sales and mitigate risk, this is one potential tool uh, in the toolbox that you can offer to, uh, to exporters as a potential uh, solution for their, for their uh, sales. Um, I think I'll leave it there. And then if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh Questions? Jeff, I've got one. It's uh, Max Boncaster. Could you explain a little bit about how you all make sure that the um, benefits are accruing to American exporters and using American products? What some of the safeguards you have in place are? Sure. Um, I mean, that is one of the requirements of the program is the letter of the, well, Two things. So one is at the basic uh, level is going to be the sales contract between the U.S. exporter and the uh, foreign importer. 
there's going to be a sales contract with uh, a specified uh, commodity, and it must list uh, U.S. commodity as well as you know the specs for that commodity. And then that is also going to be uh, listed in the letter of credit, which is a requirement of the program. So it's a letter of credit based program. So the importer must open that letter of credit with a participating uh, foreign bank, and then a U.S. bank confirms that letter of credit on behalf of the exporter generally. Uh, so in those two documents, um, the letter of credit and the firm sales contract, uh, as well as um, some of the shipping documents, uh, we will see the specification for uh, U.S. commodity. And so um, we generally uh, rely on those documents, but in the instances of uh, fraud or if we thought there was a need to um, investigate further, then we would certainly do that. But uh, we find that generally uh, those documents are uh, sufficient to, to provide that it's U.S. commodity being shipped under the program. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Jeff. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to, uh, to meet with our committee today. Uh, appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Great. So next agenda item is just a recap of our uh, discussion yesterday with Ambassador Dowd. Uh, Ambassador Greg Dowd is the chief um, agricultural negotiator in the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. He was joined by Julie Callahan, assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Agricultural Trade and Commodity Policy. Um, I'm going to just start by um, identifying a few of the takeaways I have, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike and then uh, Max following Mike to see if they have any um, any thoughts. Um, so he spent a, a fair amount of time talking about the China One Agreement and reporting uh, great progress in terms of the procedural aspects of that agreement and China's compliance with something like 50 of 56 or 58 um, procedural requirements. Um, also, he reported that uh, overall exports to China are, from the US are up. Um, it's seen a, a lot of movement in the corn and soybean um, arena. Uh, and uh, so I think, you know, again, the takeaway is that he feels like uh, things are moving well on the China One Agreement and uh, um, they're continuing to, uh, to, you know, put pressure on China to uh, comply with all aspects of that agreement. Um, secondly, I think there was optimism about the UK um, FTA um, and, um, you know, that's been, been a, a virtual negotiation. Um, uh, uh, been, been ongoing through the COVID-19 process. Um, he's somewhat pessimistic about India and movement on uh, eliminating or reducing the uh, the uh, retaliatory tariffs that uh, India's put in place on some U.S. ag products, um, particularly um, apples and uh, and pulse crops. And finally, um, I did I did discuss briefly the uh, the USTR uh, Department of Commerce and USDA. Um, plan to support seasonal and perishable fruit and vegetable producers. So that um, that kind of covers it for me, Mike. Um, your thoughts? Well, again, I just I really thought that was a good uh, a good discussion, and and Greg uh, candid as always, and and uh, given a kind of a tour of what's happening. I I've said many times this year that uh, I think 2020 was was shaping up to be a year where we would be talking a lot about trade and and. You know, after two years of so much uncertainty on trade negotiations and, um, you know, to, to have agreements in place that he talked about with Japan and, uh, and China phase one and USMCA, you know, uh, that's probably one of the, uh, the, the, the biggest things that I think we just, we would have been talking a lot about. We aren't now because of some of the, the challenges and yet that foundation is there. <clears throat> um, Greg's always good and I'm glad he talked about it to talk about those underlying pieces that are being addressed in that China phase one agreement. It's not just about the, the amount of, uh, uh, you know, the purchases, the orders being made. It, it, it's always also been about those structural pieces that needed to be addressed. And, and uh, uh, Max, to your point, and this is really an important point, uh, phase one is phase one. We expect, and there needs to be phase two and, and uh, a full free trade agreement with Japan. You know, we've got a food and ag early harvest and, and a, a digital, uh, 
you know, technology or digital uh, 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 piece that was addressed early, but we need a full free trade agreement with that very important uh, export market. So uh, we've got a heck of a lot of work to do. And, uh, and then maybe some of you heard my question, just something we're thinking an awful lot about, which is, you know, you can virtually connect with folks around the world, but um, when do we start once again going? And, and uh, what's the right time for that? What's that look like? Does, uh, does public sector need to go first because private sector won't maybe be able to go? Uh, you know, how, how do those things look? And, and of course it won't be a, it'll be an asymmetrical start for sure. Uh, and so is there an early mover advantage that we need to be thinking about there? So I just know there's a lot of folks rolling those things around uh, in heads. I guess the other piece, you know, just aside from, uh, um, you know, the, the trade aspects is, uh, uh, you know, that on onboarding of some new staff there at uh, USTR, very impressive individual. So again, I just really uh, uh, enjoyed that, that conversation as always, and glad we've got such a, such a, an individual who's willing to engage with us at, in that way. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mike, a lot of good points. Um, and I, yeah, I wanna emphasize the one, one point you made about, uh, you know, the question around when we, when we start doing the trade missions again, both inbound and outbound. I mean, that's been a big part of our book of work and certainly it's, uh, you know, it's a forcing us to do, to, I think in some respects, not being as effective as we like to be in terms of promoting um, uh, US um, agricultural products. So thank you, Mike. Max, do you have any thoughts about our discussion yesterday? Yeah, thanks, Director Sanderson. I, I, uh, I think you guys both hit on the the two you know major points that I had in mind. I thought just the, the comments about India are always interesting to me. I know that's another market that we're always looking at, and there's you know kind of we've had negotiations there in fits and starts. So I was happy to see him uh, address that a little bit. Um, one question I had for the group was about how folks are kind of ranking. Uh, some of the emerging markets. I mean, I know there's a lot of interest um, in seeing where USTR goes with the UK and obviously the big markets in Asia. But you know, at one point, um, Kenya was on the radar, um, emerging markets. So I'm curious to know from from some of our members if there are other markets that um, Ambassador Dow didn't touch on that we should be aware of or that that might be particularly important for their states. Uh, this is Ben Thomas from Montana. We uh, participated in a trade mission to Asia. I know you had mentioned not Asia, but I wanted to call this out specifically um, because I did a address it with the administration. Vietnam, I believe, needs to move up the list of priorities. The amount of wheat they're importing is tremendous, uh, and just so little of that coming from the United States, probably uh, around 5% of the uh, several, couple, at least billion dollars they import. So I hope to see that move up in the priority list. Thanks, Director. That's, that's helpful to know. And I, certainly Vietnam was, you know, one of the big uh, aspects of TPP as well. You know, even when we were thinking about TPP, and that was still in the mix, Vietnam was always kind of hanging out there. And um, I know USDA has done some trade missions in the past couple of years to that market as well. So I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Anything else, Max? That's it for me, Director. Thank you. Uh, uh, Derek, I have a quick question for Max, if that's okay. Sure. So the, uh, the, uh, Exports, the corn and soy exports to China, it seems tremendous. Do we know what all of this is going to uh, in the immediate term? Is it really the, the herd expansion that this is exporting? Is it going to be stored? Uh, what do we know about that? Yeah, it's a great question. My understanding is most of it is destined for, for animal feed. And that's been the big, the big purchases just as they're rebuilding their herd and kind of trying to ramp up protein production. Um, I haven't heard much about going to storage, but I also, you know, don't know all the all the details. Um, I know Secretary Nagy or uh, Director Sanson, if you have any other insight as well. My understanding is the same as yours that a lot of it's going to feed. That, as you said, that they're rebuilding the herds after African swine fever. And, yeah. Same. Thank you. And then, uh, Director, I also see a, a, a question in the chat from um, Director Miyamoto about, uh, you know, eminent and immediate announcement regarding dairy compliance with USMCA. Um, 
I have not heard any specifics about what that enforcement might look like. I do know that the dairy industry has been very vocal about some dissatisfaction with how Canada is rolling out their initial tariff um, rate allocation quotas and basically the amount that they can import and at what levels. Um, Canada made a lot of commitments in, in the USMCA to get rid of class six and seven milk pricing and make sure that they were allocating uh, their dairy quotas in, in a much more fair way to US exporters. So I know folks have been um, very keyed in on that. I don't know, Commissioner Ball, um, if you're here, if you've got any other insights to share from or any, any other folks who have been talking to their dairy uh, producers in their state, but um, I know it's high on USTR's radar. I just don't have any specifics on what the uh, announcement or what the immediate enforcement action might be. I don't have any breaking news, Max. Uh, our dairy industry, and I know many of the other dairy partner states are in uh, NASDA. I've been watching this very closely. Uh, we got some successes through the Trinational Court and through the USMCA. Uh, so my ear is also perked up when uh, uh, Ambassador Dowd mentioned that uh, an enforcement mechanism will roll out uh, very soon with regards to Canada on dairy. Uh, so we'll be anxiously waiting to see what that looks like. He also mex mentioned uh, Mexico with regards to some of their protectionist efforts recently. So I think we got to watch very closely to see what happens there. Hi, this is Randy Romanski from uh, Wisconsin. As luck would have it, we just had a, our uh, Ag Talks Wisconsin yesterday and this topic did come up. Uh, don't have uh, anything uh, any breaking news to share from what we learned from that other than that there is some interest in, in seeing some additional enforcement uh, about the issues just mentioned. Well, thank you all. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, uh, just if there's any general questions or suggestions on um, what we should be um, kind of focusing on next. Uh, this is, you, you can, uh, this is the time to do it. So. Um, Anything from uh, from the members? Uh, Mike, any closing thoughts? You know, um, maybe in addition to trade, of course, uh, just thinking a lot about. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're I think we're all in a similar situation where we're we're trying to digest and learn from what we just went through in terms of are there. Um, supply chain disruptions that, you know, what do we need to do there to strengthen the supply chain? Are there new markets, additional markets, diversification that we can be looking at? I mean, I just think those are, there's, there's a time and a, there'll be a time and a place for us to look back on this year and, and have some of those conversations, a lot of good things being shared from state to state. But I know that's where my, my head is, at least in terms of supply chain issues domestically. And then, and again, you've heard me talk about it like time and time again, but I just think I think heading into 21, we've got a lot of work to, um, and, and this organization has an opportunity to really help put the shoulder to taking full benefit and if, you know, those agreements that have been put in place and, and not resting there. Um, so I just think this, this conversation, this group and the policies and action items that'll come out of here will be uh, as important as ever uh, as, we, as we go into, uh, into, into the next year. So, um, I think that that's it for closing comments but thanks yeah thank you mike and i mean I, and, and to borrow a sports term i think we're going to be in a rebuilding year um coming up here and trying to get back on our feet and uh and you know get get back to full stride in terms of the uh, both marketing and trade issues so max anything in closing just that nasa staff are here to help on uh, trade issues as they come up obviously you know we're, we're monitoring the big ticket items and and uh, trying to make progress on those for all states, but we also really rely on feedback from our state, um, not only as members, but our marketing staff and folks who are talking to companies and seeing things on the ground. So um, anything or you know, any uh, questions or things that we can do to be helpful, please don't hesitate to let us know. And, and, and as always, you know, thank you, Max, to you and to the NASA staff for, uh, for helping us uh, be effective as a committee. So really appreciate that. So I'm going to dispense with a motion to adjourn since we're virtual and just <laughs> we'll stay stay somewhat informal here. So thank thank you everybody and uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye.